You must obey the Supreme Court. Former Governor Adams Oshio Male criticizes President Buhari, CPN governor, over Naira crisis. Appeal Court affirms Bill Duhoye Banji as governor of Ekiti State. The African Democratic Congress, ADC, endorses Peter Obi, the Labour Party presidential candidate, for the Saturday poll. And now away from Nigeria, Sierra Leone's opposition selects Samura Kamara as presidential candidate amidst graft charges. And finally, United Nations others ask for $45.3 million in aid for cholera outbreak in Malawi. This is Politics HQ. We continue after this. Now the days have slowly but surely wound down to the last few days before Nigeria's general elections kick off. It's obvious, online and offline, that the country's political parties are in the last frenzied days of campaigning. Candidates, supporters and voters are all expressing their readiness for this crucial election. And Nigeria's electoral umpire, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has prepared for February 25th and March 11th, 2023, for the past four years, and has every concerned Nigerian and those with their eyes on the elections from outside looking for it to deliver free, fair, and credible elections. There is something in the air, but it's different depending on who you talk to. Some have said it's an air of expectation of change. Others carry an air of victory already. And still others feel tension in the air and are preparing for the worst. From workplaces to the markets, bars, pubs, schools, stores, and almost everywhere, the country is alive as the clock runs down the final days till February 25th. And with less than four days to go, there are many issues that still need to be explained, clarified, and highlighted. This is where my guests tonight come in. Joining me tonight is Moise Banire, Dr. Moise Banire. He's a senior advocate of Nigeria. And also joining me is Shegun Shoumi, former PDP and Atiku spokesperson. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on Politics HQ. Good evening. Thank you. Nice to see you. And also, Look audience out there. All, the all right. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Tolu Lakwe Adeleru Balogun. Let's get started. So, um, Dr. Banire, I want to start with you, and that's particularly because of what we know is going to happen tomorrow, but also some developments today. And that's the case before the Supreme Court. So today, Kaduna, Kogi, and Zamfara State have filed a contempt proceeding against the Attorney General of the Federation, Abrakar Milami, and the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefiele, for failing to comply with the order of the Supreme Court that suspended the ban on the old 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira notes. Now, they filed the forms on behalf, or rather their lawyers filed the forms on behalf of the states, and that now becomes part of the applications awaiting the Supreme Court's consideration as it resumes proceedings tomorrow, Wednesday. While we know the case is in court and it is sub -judice, with your experience, Dr. Banire, do you think we're seeing contempt of court really play out in these circumstances? Well, certainly I do not see it playing out because in the first instance, they need to be served personally. Uh, let's presume, let's assume that they've even been paid, uh, they've been served the processes personally. There are two levels. There is the 448 and the 449. So the first one I'm sure is the one that maybe at best they must have served today. So they still need to serve the second one, which is from 49. I, I reckon from my own uh, political experience that all this thing will fizzle out by next week. So I'm not too optimistic that this case will eventually be determined even by the Supreme Court. Along the line, I suspect that it become an academic case, academic question, which the court does not answer. That's my suspicion. So I don't see any content or conviction happening tomorrow at all. Mm. And you take me to a point that I'm going to re, uh, touch base on in just a little bit. But February 22nd is the day that the Supreme Court said it would resume hearing on the case that was initially brought before it by Kogi, Kaduna, and Zamfara State. Um, and what we know right now with the Supreme Court is we've seen that President Buhari has apparently flouted the court's order on terms of maintaining the status quo. So, Shagun, let me bring you in here. Do you think, in particular, as you've seen the president's stance 
on this Naya redesign issue and in particular the court's order that has been, of course, the injunction that the Supreme Court issued um, last week. Do you think there is going to be a change in the president's stance? First of all, I want to say that when people say they have flouted the status quo, <laughs> you just laugh at these people. The definition of what is the status quo, what exactly is that status quo? Is the status quo the status quo as per the date that the president said, I mean, the last order, which is still the 10th, or is the status quo as per their wish in their prayer, which the court has not even dealt with in real sense? Look, I think for me, it's just a very sober period for us as a nation in democracy where we can ask ourselves really, why do members of a party in government feel the need to now take on their government to the level that they're taking it on with all of the inability of other people in the world to see what's going on in Nigeria, especially given the track record of the characters that are involved in this thing. They are also coming to public speaker, you know, that these are very altruistic men who have always been standing with the public who you know, diligent on the application of law when it concerns them. They themselves obey, control them. They have some kind of equity they come to reclaim hand. But when you see the characters that are involved in this, it worries you. It worries me because you want to ask, is it that people are thinking that democracy is a system of government where there is no authority, or that democracy, Africa, Nigeria style is, you know, is the government system that allows people to just overheat the polity and create a sort of mumbo jumbo and main overheating process. What's going on here? We are trying to change currency. Are we the first one in the world to do it? I would like to give the example of India. In 2016, the Prime Minister Modi did the same thing in India. He gave it about four to six hours. And as big as the country is, as dispersed as it is, as good as it is, the quality of its population, so the property numbers they have there, they complied. All that they have asked us to do, they gave us three months to take our money to the bank. Why does it take forever? They are the ones even instigating people and making them make a run on the system. And I, I really want to commend the president for having the stillness and the maturity. I just try to imagine if Ambassador President Ambassador was the president and how he would have been reacting now with all of these uh, shenanigans going on. Carry with it the risk that you know the mob would take advantage of this, you know, uh, you know, prodding by high level members of society mm. to begin to do violence. It's the most thing for me. The CBN has that responsibility to manage these things, and the president has within the constitution to all of these things. Did they do it well? Would I have prepared the back end of that? Of course, I would have prepared that they tidy themselves up on the back end. But the person who the policy they are running, they do not accept that high level force within the Nigerian space should act the way affairs are acting. It's okay, a shame. So, really. Shago, I, I want to quit your thoughts very quickly before I move on, but this point you've made a bit about what you described as shenanigans. We've seen Governor Nasser Arufai of Kaduna State, who's also a member of the President's Party, direct MDAs in his state to accept payments in old Naira new notes, which is contrary to the President's directive which he says he was simply following the order of the Supreme Court. So as somebody of another party watching this internal, uh, watching sort of this, this politics or this internal wrangling play out, and then also as a Nigerian, what do you think this, is a, this picture is painting of what's going on behind the scenes, particularly for the APC and possibly internal party issues that the APC may be having? Very quickly, Shagun. Treason is a very serious offense, and people must know the implication of treason. Second of all, I think that uh, with due respect to him, some governors in this country, they, they wish to be dictators in their space. And because they've been allowed to get away with so many things that really the system should have come to them, they have not interpreted that the sovereign authority of a nation, which ultimately resides in the person that was given her powers as the president, is also what they will now begin to challenge and put their fingers in it. When the president is able to you know, tolerate it, good for them, I think that the end of the president tells them that, look, that is enough. I'm not going to have you overheat the policy or implode the country on my watch. I mean, I need powers to the president. There are no more guys of the presidency that can give you the quasi opportunity to say, I want to have this, I want to have this, I want to have this. 
They're not as brave as they pretend to be. They're not as brave. And I think that this has nothing to do with partisanship because the policy affects everybody and it affects us too. And we are just as, you know, surprised that when it came as they are. You can somebody look at some of the intended purposes. One of them could be to take out all the movies that are in the place that is not participating in production. Another could be to prevent criminal from real counterfeiting. Another one could be to, to cut off the, you know, the people of those who are doing ransoms and all that. The inconvenience, yes, every policy comes is only inconvenient. Anybody who tells me that he has been a governor in any state, and we've been in democracy since 1999, and he's speaking to Trump, his test, and he's telling us that there are corners in the states where they have GSM, but they can't even find them banks in that area. You can tell that we are not as serious as we be. But this is system. But this is what I say that we are doing what you call a zombie federation. A zombie federation is a federation where the people that are causing problems with federation, once we want to not put them right, they will not instigate the people again to fight the person that is trying to set them right. I don't get it really. I don't get it. And I think truly the president has really tried to be a diplomat and a democrat. I think no nation should allow itself to be right, a dream of like a, a leap of the water. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Banire, you've heard a word that I've heard, and I think many Nigerians have heard in this situation, and, and that's treason. So I have a two-part question uh, for you. There have been some articles and some conversations around Nigeria that uh, the possible acts by some people involved in this situation meets the heavy, very, very heavy load of being treasonable acts against the Nigerian state. That's part one. Let me know what you think about that. If some of these actions, whether it's from the president or even the governor or even the central bank governor, may meet up to the heavy load of, of treason. But beyond that, you said something earlier, and I want to follow up on that, that you don't think that this case will pass much more than in the next week or so. We know that now there's Katsina, Lagos, Cross River, Ogun, Ekiti, Ondo, and Sokoto, who have joined the legal battle against the federal government, while Edo and Bielsa have joined the federal government as respondents. When you look at this, do you think this case is really centered around the presidential elections and maybe by chance the governorship elections on March 11th and beyond that, as you said, it will really fizzle out? I want you to go deeper into this. Well, the, I'll start from the rear. I believe that the center that ran the election, gubernatorial as well as the presidential, and by the time those are concluded, you will not see this agitation going on. And that is why I believe that those who are uh, uh, on the street for the purpose of running the policy down do not really mean well, in my very, very strong view. Like the uh, me right they said, three months is more than sufficient for anybody with sufficient card in his hand. How much time do you want to have in your house that in three months you cannot deposit? My position is simply that if you still have any extra cash beyond three months, then I suspect it must be most likely the proceed of a crime, an illicit fund. Because three months is more than, even if you have, say, 20 million naira with you at home, if you are depositing at an average of 500,000 per day, you are finished it. And I do not see how somebody will even be keeping as much as 20 million naira cash in his house. So that's number one. Number two is the fact that I believe, and we experienced something similar in Ogo State yesterday, uh, when I said earlier in one of my tweets, that look, my suspicion is that all this grandstanding is all about the election, so that those funds already mocked from the society, from circulation, will be used for the purpose of vote buying. We saw it yesterday when the governor, uh, state government started distributing old notes to the citizen. Of course, that is validation of my position. And so for me, I believe that the whole essence is to ensure that between now and the end of the election, people are able to have the impression, wrongly in my view, that the old notes are still acceptable, which is not anyway, because no governor of any state has the legal capacity or competence to declare what is a legal tender in Nigeria. So they cannot do so. Then secondly, let me also add, for those of them saying they are obeying the in Supreme Court director. Of course, at the first instance, are they the Supreme Court? Secondly, when an order is directed, are the order directed to them? The orders are simply directed against the federal government. Now, if it's directed against the there is something called due process, which they are just initiating now. That is the way to compel obedience, obedience to a court order. It's not for you 
to now enthrone anarchy in the state. In fact, for me, there are the people trying to enthrone anarchy. And I agree with Tommy that this thing, except for the fact that they enjoy immunity under the Constitution, is treasonable. It's simply treasonable. You cannot be declaring still something else in your own territory other than what the head of the Federation has declared. Mm. So for me, it's all about this election. By the time the mighty level comes and is done, in fact, I suspect that by between 24th, that is Thursday and uh, Sunday, you start seeing the flow of new notes in the society, in the, in, in, in the country. Most of these new notes are already uh, mopped up and stored somewhere. And currency, as you know, it is not meant to be stored. It's meant to be in circulation. Yes. When the people that are not needed for a purpose have cutted them and locked them up somewhere, that is where you experience this kind of scarcity that is going on. And I bet you, just what this weekend, you start seeing this currency coming out, and by the time we have the governorship, the whole place will be uh, flooded with the new notes. And I think that is what is going on. It's all political as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and you know, flooding the pol pol flooding the polity with the new notes, and of course, you mentioned, of course, uh, that video that was trending on social media yesterday, seeing old notes being offered to Nigerians. It takes us directly to the issue of vote buying. Dr. Banu, I'm going to stay with you. Shegun, I'm coming to you as well. But vote buying has been touted as one of the reasons behind this redesign policy, particularly the push to make it effective at least before the elections. Do we really think that this redesign policy will have the effect that it that it intends or it's intended to have when it comes to vote buying will it put a dent in vote buying will it curb it if you had to weigh it on a scale of maybe one to ten how effective do you think the policy will be if we have a scarcity where many people already suspect that politicians already have their hands on the new naira notes and it's the politician that's able to offer the new naira notes that becomes just a bit more attractive to the voter voters that are particularly struggling right now. Dr. Banire, what do you think? Well, I believe that it's going to be potent uh, at the end of the day. You see, somehow, I don't know how it has happened, but maybe it's through the social media, a lot of Nigerians somehow now are much more enlightened. They will collect the money, so such a number of people will collect the money and still vote their conscience. More to when they know the whole lesson, the rationale behind all these things. And I think that is my view. It certainly, it might not be absolute, but at least, like you said, on that radar, maybe six over ten at the barest minimum, the policy will have succeeded in that wise. If you want to buy, how much do you want to use? How much do you have of the new note? How much? You can't, you, they couldn't have, they can't have the amount they ordinarily would have had if the old note is, permit, is permitted. That's the truth. Okay, Shagun, let me come to you with that question. On a scale of 1 to 10, how much of an impact do you think this redesigned policy will have on curbing vote buying when it comes to Election Day, not just February the 25th, but also March the 11th as well? If there's no money, then what are you going to use to buy the vote? I think that um, one of the painful things about the way we're going up the democracy in our country is the absence of democratic consequences. In the first instance, we have enough laws, money living dream now, what have you, that ordinarily should have started telling us that a certain part of behavior is not acceptable. Now, it's even made worse when some people are blazingly showing their hands as people who are standing against what some of us preach, which is let us reduce, let us people put their will and their conscience. And the policy has come that can help us in that direction. In the first hour, I'm sure that. The other agencies of government, the FCC, ICPC, the police, and which are we will start beaming their sunlight on these guys that are spying more than everybody else. That's what I would do. The other thing we expect is that if we continue to pretend as if elite consensus will always prevent this country from making rational decisions that is for the corporate group of all of us, including the country, then we we'll have to ask ourselves. Is democracy even worth it? Well, I try to quickly go back to the military and imagine that maybe the military of state have said it's changing currency. Well, these guys have been talking in the street doing what they're doing. I don't think that democracy means ruthlessness. I don't think that democracy means showing the integrity of a nation, one of it being the labor tender of the country, the policy, and the management of state. I don't think that that's an area where you expect people to be living in a sort of competitive manner, as though, even though they have some powers, 
according to the constitution. But I don't think there's anybody who imagines that a council has the same power as a local government chairman. A local government chairman has the same power as a governor. How many of you will never say one governor, a few governors have the same power as a collective government or a president? So for me, I think when you still really want to tell if the citizens will also really get what's going on, I think it will come with it. And if it was not copy, I think the only one who needs to go around, and if they don't want really to go around, I think there's a little bit in the middle of that to still try whatever decision they would like to do with their vote. Like, whatever the case may be, I think this is one of those that we want to tell them, the gentlemen, this is correct, this is not correct. I want to let them understand that. You may have immunity from prosecution, you don't have immunity from profiling, you don't have immunity from big questions. You don't have the immunity from being, you know, to get the they don't have the cure the material you need for prosecution. And if your immunity is over, you will come and answer to this madness so that you don't make it a habit. But if tomorrow now, the president of the country says there's the public holiday, some people will bring those go to the Supreme Court and they say that the past company of them, they are having the public holiday. If the president says we are doing independence and that on October first, some people will just go see that one color and say they want to have their own on January second. This kind of lawlessness is not to be tolerated. And there is nothing to be gained in an election that will address this. That's my position on that. All right, so I want to go to another court case that we've kept an eye on, and that happened at the state level here in Lagos. So just yesterday, the federal high court in Lagos granted an injunction restraining INEC from using, engaging, or further dealing with the chairman of the Lagos Parks uh, and Garages, Musulu Akinsanya, a.k.a. MC Oloma, or any of his representatives in the distribution of election materials and ad hoc staff for the forthcoming polls in the state. So apart from the Labour Party and its governorship candidates, Badibor Rhodes Viver, the other political parties who also filed this application were the African Democratic Congress as well as the Boot Party. Just about a week ago, I spoke to Festus Okoye, INEX National Commissioner and Chairman of its Committee on Information and Voter Education, on this particular issue, and this is the explanation he gave. So I want us to listen to what he said about INEC working with transport unions, and then we'll come back to this. We have an MOU with the National Union of Road Transport Workers. And that MOU is for them to act as a, 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 a to, let, if you permit me to use the word, to put an eye on some of their members to make sure that they do what is right. Mm -hmm. We have a contract with individual drivers. Each driver that is going to convey any of our materials will be given a contract to sign. So our contract is between the individual, individual driver, and the commission, and not with the union. What we have with the union is what we call a memorandum of understanding relating to the fact that if, if they are, uh, we have hired a particular bank and they know their members, and the person does not show up on election, on election day, they will assist us and call the person and find out why the person has not showed up on, ele on election day. For states that do not have the National Union of Road Transport Workers, what we need is a situation where we can be sure that a particular driver belongs to the union or a particular driver uh, can be located on election day so that the driver does not collect our money and, the, and, the, and, the, and disappear. Mm. We are also profiling all those drivers through the Federal Road Safety Commission. They will profile them individually and also make sure that the vehicles that are producing are road well. So we have contract with individual drivers. The National Union of Road Transport Workers do not have vehicles. The individuals have. The National Association of Road Transport Owners do not drive vehicles. The individuals do. So it is those drivers that we have contract with. What we have with the unions and any other organ or any other agency is a memorandum of understanding. But in terms of moving our election materials, in terms of moving our election petition, uh, election personnel, it is with the individual drivers that we have. So, Fester Sukoye said that this is also a replicated model or method that INEC is using across Nigeria. So, Dr. Banire, let me come to you with this. In terms of the logistics issues, particularly for Lagos, which is another election that many people have their eyes on, in terms of how Lagos will vote in the presidential and the decision Lagos will make on March 11th, where do you think this leaves INEC now? Because what we're hearing is that INEC says it will no longer work with... Um, with Musilu Akinsanya, but where does that leave them in terms of moving materials and even election personnel around on election days? What, what I have 
from him today in his uh, broadcast uh, or interview with a right television, uh, which is complementary to what you just said, is that, and he just repeated it, they have only memorandum of understanding with the national bodies of the union and not a specific person. If, for example, as he said, if they are dealing with NURTW now, it will be NURTW in all the states where they exist. If they are doing with, uh, dealing with RTA, road transport employer, then they will be dealing with, uh, uh, they will be dealing with those in those states. So, uh, the contradiction that I don't seem to understand, which is a bit of confusion to me, is that in one breath, he said they have an MOU with those unions at the lateral level, uh, and at the same time, simultaneously having a contract within the union, how that works, I don't understand, and that's where my own confusion lies. I'm not too sure that they are going to be IMP into individual contractual relationship with each driver across the entire nation. Honestly, I would have expected, and I hope that that is what it meant, is that if, for example, NUITW exists in Abuja and you need 1,000 vehicles, NUITW that will contract with you to make sure that we are providing the 1,000 vehicles inclusive of the drivers that will drive those vehicles. And if anything goes wrong, we hold NUITW, NUITW responsible for it. So, if that position is what it meant, then all these. Uh, uh, allegation or contra allegation about using the legal state tax money to will not even arise at all because, as you said, they are dealing with the unions, not individuals. Thank you. Okay, but particularly in Lagos, because right before that, he did mention, of course, that NURT uh, W had been disbanded in Lagos, and that's when the governor set up the uh, Lagos parks and garages. But, Shegun, when you look at this, this is, again, as I said, the method that. Sorry, can I give okay. you a bit okay, of please. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Bani. Lagos is not only NURT W that operates in Lagos. Ro uh, RT RT so. It's not that, uh, I, I don't know, maybe he doesn't have that information. It's not only IURTW. Mm, okay. Uh, so, Shagun, let me come to you on this, because this is a method that INEC employs across the country to distribute election material and personnel. Looking at this as an opposition party, uh, possibly in a state like Lagos, or an opposition party elsewhere, wouldn't you have expected more opposition parties at state levels to head to court in similar situations? Because the belief of many Nigerians is often that the management or the higher ups of organizations such as the NURTW or RTEAN happen to often be quote unquote in bed with state governments. Hello Shagun. I'm sure that. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I, mean, I, like, I, like, I like to always say to people that there's no point finding roof when you have there's none. There's no misclaiming when there's none. We have been, if you have been able to get a chance, it's trying to build a new movement. What do you expect? You have to bring vehicles to these people who will move the cars, the material, to put the unit to work and all of that. There is something called the forward ending of the logistics. Everybody will see whether they got their material. The moment there is a reverse logistic, it will be accounted for. It doesn't even if any procedure. Even if it is Muslim, you see that it's even carrying all the vehicles. So what really does it mean? But the a problem in this country that we've been begging you to step away from. We never go into anything with optimism and infuse hope that it works. We seem to be a people that stand in one spot and everything can't work. It's the same reason why they introduce the currency. That are the constitution we probably through the land of making work. All the children of the society are sitting down there. So he does it, it won't work, it won't work, it won't work. We don't understand what that is coming from. If we don't have vehicles to, if INEC cannot get vehicles to move to the to the looks like the that they move to, how do you expect the election to happen properly? Because I think they have a logistic company they can use, maybe like a big logistic company, maybe they can try that. But no, we are only trying to elect people. It's not as serious as as it is not going to go so anyone. It's the you look at the you know energies to do a lecture. These guys are putting a pretty tight document. Some people are responsible for those board. They only do that. They go to collect material and bring CBN. What you have suggested for them that when they count it, what is the choice? What is the for them that distributed to the world? What you have suggested for them that 
We have the history, we give them the we give them the children in the vehicle, and we do the way we see. What has never been our history? I think that the only one who was in a position like PDP and the big position on the state of the table, even if you see, who understands what the table, what the election really means, they don't just go to the place looking for a bit of blame or believing that there's a conspiracy against them. That's, that's it, but they have a right to go to court and they have to go to court. Okay. And to, 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 unfortunately, so long as it's done too, they look really better themselves in their ultras and their behavior in public space. So people can be a little bit nervous, but it's just an empty backing of a toothless bulldog. They do not have the capability to make the process as I see it now. All right. We'll pause here for a break, but when we come back, we'll get into what voters could be thinking with just four days, even less than four days before Nigeria's national elections. That's, of course, presidential and national assembly for February 25th, and then governorship and state house of assembly elections for March the 11th. And also touch base on the Naira scarcity and how it may be touching INEC itself. The conversation will continue on Politics HQ after this break. New Central TV, Africa's number one storyteller, has come with the best of both worlds. With a combination of news app and live TV, we ensure that you keep track of the latest headlines, breaking news, and in-depth analysis from professional journalists from around the continent. Download the New Central TV app on Android and iOS and get started today. Don't forget to follow us on New Central's social media platforms. New Central. Africa first. As Africa's most populous nation and its largest economy goes to the polls on February 25th, all eyes are focused right here on Nigeria. We can promise you round-the-clock coverage of Election Day. So make sure that you are tuned in to New Central starting from 6 a.m. on Saturday, February the 25th, as well as Sunday, February the 26th, and as well as March the 11th as well. We will give you round-the-clock coverage. We have correspondents who are going to be across the nation. We'll be in touch with observers and reporters as well from across Nigeria who will be on the ground uh, following the candidates and also following where the action is as Nigeria decides in this year, 2023. My guest this evening on Politics HQ, Senior Advocates of Nigeria, Dr. Muiz Banire, as well as uh, Shegun Shogumi, former PDP and Atiku spokesperson, but he unfortunately had to... Okay, he's still with us. He's about to leave very quickly. Uh, Shegun, because I know you have a flight to catch, let me quickly ask you this. This whole Naira scarcity, we've seen that it's extended to INEC. Nigerians might say it's even touching INEC, and because over the weekend we heard that INEC said they were hopeful they will get their cash requirements for the elections on or before today. So right now, as of this time, we haven't heard if the CBN has been able to meet INEX cash uh, requirements, but it looks like when we think about the potential for the delays related to cash funds for INEX handling of the elections, what do you think could be the impact? I think that the same way the Nigerian society is managing without the cash, that's the same place where every organization in Nigeria We'll have to figure out a way to go either by transfer or what have you. Some cash will be provided, I'm sure. It's like saying that the, the American army is going to war and then they come to public and say they can't find cash. They will find them some cash. They are concerned about stability of system, stability of countries, obeying laws that are legally passed. If the Supreme Court comes tomorrow and says something that it can enforce by itself, it will be there for us to see. But all the jokes we have been making around it is unfortunate. I mean, if anybody told me I would I'll be able to survive the length of time that we have all survived without having, you know, bringing the money around, I would argue, we are survived pretty well. Change is the only thing that is constant and we have to get used to it. People do not like to change. Or people do not like any new procedure. We will, we will lack each other. We will step over the heat. We will make progress and we will be fine. We will survive right. COVID. You submit the lockdown. Is it to change our authorizing for the government to move on? Get your feet as though the world is about to come to an end. No, 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 no. It's just an election. Just like that, for example, said, in a few minutes' time, who will win and who will lose the news? And maybe by the time Nigeria can beat this, I'll start to believe and say, 
very, 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 very well. There's no need for the first day. It's just a, it's just a process to pick somebody that will lead all of us. All right, Shagun, thank you so much. Let me now hold you back before you say we're responsible uh, for having you miss your flight. Thank you so much for joining me tonight on Politics uh, HQ. Okay. All right. So, Dr. Bani Ray, Shegu has an optimism around this, but when you think about the long lines of Nigerians, the videos, there's even one video currently trending right now of a woman and several other people climbing the iron bars to enter into a banking established in Nigeria uh, in just an attempt to get their money. Aren't you a bit concerned about sort of the conversation around INEX cash needs? Of course, they do a lot of their own movement, a lot of their transfers online, as we've seen. But there are a few cash requirements that INEC has. And as of right now, we're not sure if the CBN has been able to meet those needs, even as they said it was expected before or today. Dr. Baniwe. I think I agree with uh, Chomi that certainly INEC will have gotten something substantial. And very sure, if not everything, they will have gotten something sufficient to conduct the election. Very, very optimistic about that. And we like that optimism, especially with just about three days to go. So 93 million plus voters are expected at polling units across the country on Saturday. If you follow the trend, we may not get 50% turnout. But if you also look at the demographic breakdown that places this election to be determined by young voters, we could see numbers that Nigeria has not seen in recent elections. I say all of this to ask, how much of this election do you think is a referendum on life under the APC for the past eight years? What do you think people are voting for, and what do you think people are actually voting against in this election, particularly the presidential election? Well, people are voting against uh, what uh, possibly maybe I should describe as hopelessness. Uh, you had Governor Ganduji, who is a member of the a ruling party, and I just say one of the leaders of APC saying that the government has achieved nothing as far as it's concerned in eight years. I think that is a value that is very serious. And for the youth, look at the, as at the last count, I do, I'm not correct now, we have unemployment in excess of 40%. But well, that is enough for everybody to be on the street. So when you see all the youth trooping out now, it's going to uh, register to vote. Of course, what they are yearning for is change. For a government that will enable them to be gainfully employed, at least at the DRS minimum. There are some other people that were fruit of for insecurity. There are a lot of businessmen who ordinarily before used to be lackadaisical that we took part now because of the extreme devaluation of our currency today, whose businesses have virtually crashed, if not totally collapsed all over the place. So people have different reasons why everybody is on the street this time around to say we are want to be involved in the process of change. For young Nigerians, you mentioned unemployment, and of course, I know, you, <laughs> I know you also, may, of course, know the Japa trend that we're seeing. Young Nigerians and even families, people in middle management who are considered secure by Nigerian standards, basically upping all stakes and relocating simply because of the circumstances of the country. But particularly for young Nigerians who are the largest voting bloc in this election, do you think they will turn out? Do you think this is an election that they will decide? I'm sure they will turn out. I'm uh, quite optimistic that they will turn out. Because, you see, the one is one that will compel anybody to just want to be around to vote this time around. Since uh, even not only the youth are living, a lot of people are living. Unfortunately, we are losing a lot of our best ones. Lawyers complain regularly these days that we don't even, all most of our good ones are living. Even in my own office, just not quite in a state of one month. Two people have appropriated they are living for Canada. So this is kind of situation we are seeing. So it's not only the, uh, uh, the even the jobless or the unemployment, but the cost of the environment that is not even conducive for them to survive in a way that somebody can say that you are living. I often say, I tell a lot of people in the past, and I still maintain it, that there is a difference between living and just existing. Mm. A lot of Nigeria are just existing. They are not living. It's just like the difference between going home uh, going home and going to a house. There are two different things. And I think that's the situation we have found ourselves now. So when we look at it, uh, this race, some have said it's a three-man race or a four-man or a four-horse, whatever terminology you want to use. PDP was at the helm of affairs for 16 years. If 2023 is a referendum on the APC, you can agree that the 2015 elections was a referendum on the PDP's leadership. But now the PDP is back, again, asking Nigerians to return it to power. But there are more options now. 
Peter O.B. presents an option with the Labour Party. Rabu Kwankwanso presents an option with the uh, NPP, with the N. PPP. So when we look at it on the face value, the options are much more for Nigerians. It's not a two-party race. It's not a two-horse race. When we look at the options overall, does this make it a more exciting election? Does it make an election that there are real chances of us seeing somebody other than the two parties that we're used to seeing in recent times emerge as the winner? Yes, I agree with you. It's really exciting. It's unpredictable. One thing that it seems to be so sure is that we are going to have a buffet of candidate, or candidates emerging from different political parties this time around. You see, for me, when I, I tell people, I say, okay, what is the difference between PDP and APC? Well, today, as I'm talking to you, now, let me be conservative. Over 70% of the leadership of APC today are from PDP. Even including the national chairman of APC today is from, uh, 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 is from uh, uh, PDP. So, there is actually no difference, but this is the first time we are really having options for the people. So certainly you will find, if I, I see a situation where people will go beyond party affiliation into voting on candidate's line. To say, okay, I prefer this candidate in Labour, I prefer that candidate in APC, I prefer that candidate mm. in, uh, in PDP, I prefer that candidate in NLP, uh, uh, Cross Party. So that is what we are likely to see this time around, unlike the conventional one, that we just find two parties extending bad things. So I, I find it interesting you talk about that because that's a, a sentiment we've heard from, uh, from a lot of people outside there. There's going to be a different party they vote for when it comes to local government and possibly state house of assembly and then governorship, and then a different party at the presidential level and, of course, at the uh, national assembly level. In terms of our democracy, what do you think that means for Nigeria? And I got it wrong earlier. It's the NNPP. That's Rabbi Kwankwanso. But having this sort of political spread throughout the different levels of government, if that's what we see uh, after the elections are done, what do you think it means for our, our democracy? Well, it's strengthening our democracy. It means that we are beginning to really, really move, just like the same manner we are moving from the technological aspect when it comes to the conduct of the election itself. So it's a positive thing for us. There's still a large segment of undecided voters. Um, Dr. Banu, I don't know if you've spoken to people who say they're undecided. I don't know if you're undecided, but I won't put you on the spot like that. But we've seen many polls come out. And if polls are anything to go by, there are a large number of people up to right now who have not decided who they're going to vote for. What do you think has the power to sway or influence an undecided voter at this proverbial last minute? Well, a lot of things will come to play. Uh, I suspect that I always say, and like a lot of politicians will tell you, which is a treason, is that 24 hours is too long in policies to predict anything. We are likely to see a lot of somersault in the next few days. People cross carpeting all over the whole place. That, of course, will to a certain extent influence. Uh, for whatever it is worth to, money will do some, influence will do some. And some policy decision we also do some, for example, particularly from the uh, federal government. If there are some decisions that comes up between now and that is considered to be inimical to the interest of Nigeria, of course, some people will just cross immediately. So there are so many things that are, and of course, the utterances of the candidates themselves, so they need to watch it. This last moment, you can say something that will just switch a lot of people from their position or take them away from their undecided position to a particular uh, position. So these are some of the vagaries that we are likely to see influencing those that are yet to be decided. Mm. And you know, talking about the polls, a number of them have predicted a win for Peter OB. A lot of them also emphasizing that that could be determined based on voter turnout or the voter or the turnout for young people. Some say a win for Bola Tinubu and others say a win for Atiku Abakar. But we also saw what the polls looked like in the U.S. election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And we saw who eventually won the day. So there's the issue of methodology, sample size, and so much more when you talk about election polling. But I'm asking you this question in terms of the potential for a possibility of Nigeria's first presidential runoff. I know I, for one, am excited about that potential because, again, as we said, it expands our democracy. It also helps to test our laws. It's a maturing of the space, as it may be. But do you really see the potential of a possible runoff? Because it's really looking tight. And not to 
not to dismiss or dissuade Rabbi Kwan Kwan So, there are those who believe he could be a dark horse in this election with the power to eventually decide somehow who becomes the winner. Well, I think I quite agree with your last statement. He's going to play a very, very crucial uh, role at the last moment. Uh, whatever be his position at the end of the day. Uh, but beyond that, honestly, I'm not that optimistic that there will be a runoff. Mm. There could be a, we, there was, in my view, there's likely to be a winner that will come up with a very, very simple or narrow margin at the end of the day. But I'm not really, really optimistic that we will have a runoff. I'm not, I'm not positive about that. Dr. Bonnie, before I let you go, INEC, Supreme Court, uh, Lagos cases in court as well. At the end of the day, 93 million plus voters are heading to the poll, but we all seem to be focused on the presidential. And I've spoken to a number of civil society organizations, but the worry is this attention is also not focused or highlighted on the governorship elections. What do you say to voters? Because after the fur, after the frenzy of the presidential and national assembly elections die off, there is still March 11th, and there's a lot of attention we need to focus on the subnational, on the states and the local governments. But some would say Nigeria's politicians have succeeded in diverting all attention and focus to the center. I think I agree with you. If I go beyond even the subnational, the legislators, we have the senatorial and the House of Rep coming up also, and these people are a critical component of our democratic system. But unfortunately, we pay no attention to them at all. They, in my very, very uh, strong view, can even make things happen much more than the president if truly they are independent and they do their work objectively. And the challenge we've been having is that we have robots being ultimately elected into those houses because we pay no attention to it. The same thing with the subnational. In fact, at the subnational level, there will be a lot of. Um, uh, novelties, so I can put it that way this time around, because I suspect that a lot of uh, governors have lost touch with their constituents and uh, the traditional mode of uh, claiming or reclaiming popularity is being threatened through the catch constraint now. So it's not unlikely that some of them will easily lose the election in the process. I, I, I see that kind of a, a trend emerging uh, during the 11th uh, March election. All right, so we'll leave it at that for now. But Dr. Banu, I know that we'll be speaking to you, especially after uh, the presidential and national assembly elections, to look at the trends, the issues, and how things have played out. I'll say a very big thank you to you for joining me tonight on Politics HQ. Thank you very much. My thank pleasure. You.